All right, well, welcome back. We're going to jump into our second uh, session on the fig trees and prophecy. Uh, in the previous session, which I'm not going to spend really any time reviewing because it is standalone, uh, but what we dealt with was this concept of the fig tree generation and a common prophetic interpretation uh, of Jesus' words and verses uh, akin to Matthew 24, 34, and this notion that the generation that sees Israel become a nation is the same generation that will see the second coming of Christ. We dispelled that in a number of ways. It's not to say that Israel is not represented by a fig tree uh, in prophecy. In fact, we're going to look at the fact that it most certainly is in this session. Uh, the problem is starting your prophetic clock on Israel's return to the nation and making that a, a, a time generation, even if it's 40 years, 70 years, 80 years, 100 years, it doesn't work because setting dates, setting date ranges is still setting dates. And the Bible says no man knows the day or the hour. No man knows the date range where Christ is going to return. Um, and there is a better way, a more bulletproof way of interpreting that text that does not leave us open to having to apologize for getting it wrong when a certain date passes. That's the only point that I'm making. A lot of good teachers, a lot of good um, pastors have emphasized that fig tree generation thing over the years. And uh, unfortunately, it is just not the most sound uh, starting point for your prophetic clock. It is a sign, uh, but, but it's not quite what scripture is talking about in that sense. And we just went what, over what it really is talking about there. There are a whole bunch of signs we have to pay attention to and one that really does start it off. So if you missed that, go back and, and watch it. And I can. So in this session, what I want to do is to spend some time in the word really looking at the fig tree parables and what they mean uh, to, to make sure that we're bringing them into the correct interpretation uh, at large. <clears throat> uh, so that, because so that, uh, by and large in our prophetic uh, teaching series in this ministry so far, we haven't really covered them. So I figured we'll just do it kind of all at once. We'll bundle it up into this little two-part series that we've done, and we'll move on in our Revelation series after that. So here's, here's what I really want to show you. <clears throat> While a lot of people... Uh, like to say that, that Israel is, is really kind of like the fig tree is, is what Israel is related to prophetically. That's, that's only part of the story. And so I want to flesh out that story for you. There are actually three types of trees or three types of uh, flora in the Bible that is used in the prophetic portions of the Bible to symbolize Israel. So Israel is not only spoken of as a fig tree, but three distinct types of trees. The first of those trees is a grapevine. The second of those trees is a fig tree. And the third of those is an olive tree. And they all have their own unique branches, if you will, of uh, spiritual significance. So, yeah, you saw what I did there. That was clever. Symbolic of, your, of Israel's spiritual privileges is the grapevine. It has to do with the spiritual condition of Israel. The fig tree is symbolic of Israel's national privileges. And the olive tree is symbolic of Israel's religious privileges. Now this schema, even though it is 100% represent, 100% represented in the scriptures, as you're going to see in a moment, was really built out by a specific Bible commentator. And when I get to the end of it, I'm going to reveal who it was and why that's interesting. So I just kind of want to toss some bait out there. Pay attention. There's a little bit of a twist near the end of this one. <clears throat> but I'm taking what I'm teaching you here from that commentator's uh, material um, and, uh, and developing it as, as we go. So let's, let's talk first about some verses that show how multiple trees are, are used. Joel 1.7 
says, he has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. Micah 4, 3 uh, and 4 says, he shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But everyone shall sit under his vine or in his vineyard and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. So what I'm showing you here is that the vine and the fig tree, they prefigure the millennial days when every man shall be in a prosperous state where he can sit under his own, uh, in his own vineyard, under his own fig tree. It's a owning your own land it, it, it's it's kind of uh analogous uh it, it, it's symbolic of prosperity and so when prosperity is taken away the vine and the fig tree they're destroyed and and so it, even in an in a sense that yes uh israel is related to as the vine and the fig tree as we're going to see in a few moments personally, the vine and the fig tree, they also kind of speak to personal prosperity. And I wanted to make sure that, that I kind of laid out that point early on. So let's understand the grape vine, okay? Let's go to Psalms 80, verses 8 through 11. It says, you have brought a vine out of Egypt. What do you think we're talking about here? Obviously, the symbolism is pretty clear. That's Israel, right? You have cast out the nations and planted it. You prepared room for it and caused it to take deep root and filled the land. The hills were covered with its shadow and the mighty cedars with its boughs. This is a grapevine being described as covering cedar trees. This is a big grapevine. She sent out her boughs to the sea, which is the Mediterranean, and then branches to the river, which is the Euphrates. Uh, Euphrates. So in the words of the psalmist here, it graphically pictures the taking of Israel from the uncongenial soil of Egypt and planting them in the land of Canaan. Only God could have done this. Without his help, they never could have escaped Egypt. He transplants them because in Egypt they were degenerate and in the promised land it needed to be cleared out of weeds for it was filled with walled cities and giants according to Numbers. So once the vine was transplanted, it began to grow and spread over the land until the words of the psalm, uh, it sent out its boughs and it's uh, all the way to the Mediterranean Sea and all the way to the Euphrates River. And FYI, those are much bigger borders than we even see Israel dealing with um, today. And that, that expanse of its power would have been during the reign of King Solomon at the height of the monarchy. But this is really completely fulfilled during the millennial reign of Christ. Israel is restored to the borders that God said it would have, not that man said it should have to appease anybody. So the prophet Isaiah describes this vineyard in Isaiah 5, 1 through 2. It says, now let me sign Sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He had built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes. Again, this is talking almost more specifically than Israel, talking about Jerusalem. Why? Because Jerusalem is the vineyard on the hill. Jerusalem, when, when you're talking about the hill, the hill in Israel, you're talking about the hill that the holy city, the city of God, sits on. Okay? So also made a wine press in it, so he brought, expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. Well, that's not good. Jeremiah 2.21 says, Yet I had planted you a noble vine, a seed of the highest quality. How then have you turned before me into the degenerate plant of an alien vine? So Israel was supposed to bear good fruit, sweet grapes, awesome wine, 
But the prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah, they're saying, but you, 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 you're a weed. You're not putting forth the kind of fruit I expected. You're not reproducing after the kind that you should have. Your grapes are awful. And the punishment for this is discussed in Isaiah 5, continuing in verses 5 through 7. It says, and now please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it shall be burned. And break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down, and I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. So he's going to take the hedge of protection around the vineyard down. He's going to tear down the walls of protection that are around the vineyard. He's going to let it be burnt. Um, it's, It's the condition of Israel after being set into the Babylonian captivity that's being discussed here. The the nation is going to be overrun with thorns and thistles. That's other people groups, other nations that are living where it was always meant for the Israelites to dwell. The vineyard has been overrun. Ezekiel 15, 1 through 3 says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, how is the wood of the vine better than any other wood? The vine branch, which is among the trees of the forest, is the wood taken from it to make any object? Or can men make a peg from it and hang any vessel on? So what's being said here in common parlance is, do you know anybody that makes furniture out of grape wood? Do you know anybody that builds a house out of grape wood? Basically, what's being said in this text is that if a vine, a vineyard, a a grape vine doesn't produce fruit, it's worthless. It's not like a cedar that can be used for timber. It's not like any other tree that can be used for a constructive purpose if it's not fruiting. No, if a vineyard is not fruiting, it's only good for one thing, and that's fuel for the fire. That's all that it's good for, according to the biblical text. Okay? And Ezekiel confirms this in verse 15, 4 through 15. It says, Instead, it is thrown into the fire for fuel, for the fire devours both ends of it, and its middle is burned. It is, use, is it useful for any work? Indeed, when it was whole, no object could be made from it. How much less will it be useful for any work when the fire has devoured it and it is burned? So now not only were you useful, useless before you were burned, now you're doubly useful, useless. You're doubly worthless. You're going to go through and you're going to be burnt. You're going to be cast. So they're going to go through the fire of this punishment. They're going to be cast out of their land. Their temple's going to be burnt down. Their city's going to be destroyed. You're going to be cast out far. You were useless when you were in the land and not fruitful. Now you're going to be doubly useless when you're spread up across the Babylonian empire. You have no value. That's the, the unfruited vine. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, like the wood of the vine among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so I will give up the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will set my face against them. They will go out from one fire, but another fire shall devour them. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I set my face against them. Thus, I will make the land desolate because they have persisted in unfaithfulness, says the Lord God. So from here, we are able to understand the parable of the vineyard that Jesus gives in Matthew 21. And I wasn't going to read it, but I think we're doing okay on time. So I'm just going to blast through it super quickly. It starts in verse 33 of that chapter. And it just says, here another parable, there was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it and built a tower and he leased it to vine dressers and went far into, uh, or went into a far country. That sounds like Isaiah 5, 1 and 2, right? Now in vintage times you're near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then the last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. 
But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? And they said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyards to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruit in its seasons. So this parable reveals why the vine dressers or the keepers of the vineyard in this parable, the Jewish nation, have been cast out of the vineyard, the land. It was because they took the heir, Jesus, and crucified him. And so they were cast out of the vineyard and it has been to let other vine dressers the Gentiles, take care of the land in that period. So God is actually prophesying yet another destruction. He's saying, I sent my servants the prophets, you stoned them. I sent more prophets, you stoned them. Now I've sent my son, what are you going to do? Jesus has given this parable prophesying that you're going to kill me. And when you kill me because you reject me as your Messiah, another destruction is coming. And doesn't that harken back where Isaiah said, you came out of one fire, And you survived it. But then you're going to go through another fire. Do you see how Isaiah was even prophesying the second diaspora in his teaching there? So the vine is the symbol of Israel's spiritual privileges because they're entitled only, they're they're entitled to the land solely on the basis of their spiritual condition their spiritual state, their relationship with God is what entitles them to be in the land. And if ever their spiritual condition fails, the Bible says the land will vomit them out. So that's understanding the vine as part of the story. Now we're going to pivot and we're going to look at understanding the fig tree. And this is where we're going to get to cover a lot of those fig tree parables. (coughs) Let's go back to Matthew 24. Verse 3, and it says here, excuse me, it says, Now he sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when these things will be. And what they're saying here is, Tell us when the destruction of the temple that you were referring to previously is going to happen. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. You see, they've asked him three things. So in the previous session, we described, Jesus says, when you see all of these things, with the generation that is an eyewitness to all of the following, the abomination of desolation, the signs in the heavens, and the sign of the Son of Man coming, will not pass away until the Son of Man actually comes in the clouds. That's what Matthew 24 is saying. But as we know, Christ also made a reference to the fig tree. He says in Matthew 24, 32 and following, Now learn this parable from from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. So let's talk about a few unique things about figs. Because we need to understand fig horticulture in order to understand these parables, because I don't know about you, maybe somebody online has within the sound of my voice, but I've never raised a fig, right? I'm no fig expert. So I looked up some fig experts, and I learned that fig trees can produce up to three crops a year. Three different crops a year. The common or edible fig is native to the Mediterranean Israel region, And the first group of figs develops on the previous year's shoot growth sometime around May. So the new growth from the previous year develops the next year's harvest. Okay. The two main crops take place in July through November. And they happen because pollinated figs They get their pollination in August through September. There's a wasp that actually does it. The common fig can markedly increase its size. And and these are the good figs. In contrast to most fruit trees, 
the autumn figs, the main crop, they develop on the new wood that grew the previous spring. So the first crop grows on the shoot growth of the previous year, but this autumn growth, it grows on the new growth of the previous year's crop, or of, of the previous spring's crop. So those autumn figs develop on the new wood that grew in the spring. So some unique aspects of the fig harvest, the earliest figs, the earliest figs are ripe, they're very good, and they're a relatively small crop of figs with the best flavor. You get those figs about June or July. That's why Jesus says summer is near. We can see these figs referenced in the Bible in places like Isaiah 28, 4. And the glorious beauty is a fading flower, which is at the head of the verdant valley, like the first fruit before the summer, which an observer sees. He eats it up while it is still in his hand. So then the sweetness and good fruit, or the, the season for figs that is described in another fig parable, we'll look at in a moment, the main crop is taken, and it's actually used primarily for cakes in winter use. Remember, they didn't have refrigeration and stuff back then. We get this crop in August through September. We can see a reference to this crop in Judges 9, 10 through 11. It says, Then the trees said to the fig tree, You come and reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, Should I cease my sweetness and my good fruit and go to sway over the trees? That phrase, sweetness and good fruit, didn't apply to that first harvest of figs. It was an idiom for that second main harvest of figs. So when Jesus goes to the fig tree and finds no fruit, and Mark says it was not the season for figs, it is this sweet and good fruit, fruit crop that is being referred to. In 1 Samuel 25, 18, we see, Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five sheep already dressed, five seis of roasted grain, and 100 clusters of raisin, and 200 cakes of figs, and loaded them on donkeys. And of course, this is a gift that she's going to give to David. But 200 cakes of figs, those are that summer crop that get turned into winter cakes. And then the green bad, that third bullet point, the green bad inedible figs refers to green or winter figs. They're small, they're unripened, they're unsweetened, and they're really inedible fruit. They, they bloom in the, or they, they fruit in the late fall. And sometimes what happens in those warm Mediterranean climates is the tree doesn't lose its leaves and the fruit actually will carry over and sometimes that hardened, unripened, untasty fruit will get a chance to ripen in the spring before it's time for the next first crop of the year. It's a carryover crop. In other words, it's a crop that went through hard times and you would think, given every opportunity, that that crop should have finally gotten around to fruiting. Does that make sense? It's like the last chance crop. We see that here in Song of Solomon 2.13. It says, a fig tree puts forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Isaiah, or Jeremiah 29.17 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will send on them the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, and will make them like rotten figs that cannot be eaten. They are so bad. Pretty descriptive. So what's the key point here that I'm trying to make you aware of? Well, the Bible associates all of these qualities, these different harvests, with the nation of Israel. God contrasts good Jews with sweet figs and bad Jews with unripened, unsweetened figs. God sees the minority of Israel as the first and the best of the nation. These figs contrast with the green, inedible figs, and both type of figs symbolize the people of Judah before their deportation to Babylon. They are seen as good and bad figs, and we can see that in Hosea 9.10. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the tree, the best figs, the smallest crop, the tastiest. In its first season, 
But they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves to that shame. They became an abomination like the thing they loved. I saw you as the best. But then in Jeremiah 24, 3, God says, What do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, figs, the good figs, the very good, and the bad, the very bad, which cannot be eaten, they are so bad. And here God is referring to those Jews who are wholehearted followers of God, the good figs, and to those rebellious Jews who had rejected God, the bad figs. Likewise, in the time of Christ, most Jews rejected him and remained dead in their works and legalism. They were like green, unripened, unsweetened figs. So this is where we can see the parable of the barren fig tree. And this takes place earlier, before the Olivet Discourse. We come to Luke and we get to see a parable from Luke 13, verses 6 and 7. It says, he also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. What's the vineyard? Well, we already know the vineyard is Israel, right? So now we're dealing with the vineyard and the fig tree within the vineyard. And he came seeking fruit and he found none. Sounds like something Jesus is going to do in another story in a minute, right? He says, then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for three years, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But the keeper of the vineyard answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also. I will dig around it and fertilize it. I like the King James. It says, I will dig around it and dung it. And if it bears fruit, well, great. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. In other words, let's, let's wait just a little longer. Let me try to fertilize it again. So in this parable, the fig tree is the Jewish nation. The fig tree was planted in a vineyard, which as we have seen is the land, it's Israel. The owner of the vineyard and of the fig tree was God. He came in the person of his son, Jesus, and for three years of Jesus' ministry, he had sought for fruit from the na Jewish nation, and he had found none. He therefore decided to cut down the tree that is to remove the nation from the vineyard, another diaspora, another destruction. But the tree was not destroyed immediately, Intercession was made for it, and a day of grace was lengthened. They were given time to repent, but they didn't. And so the Romans come in the form of the axe man, Titus, and besieged Jerusalem in 70 AD, and the fig tree was cut down and cast out of the vineyard into the field of the world. So now let's talk about another parable we're all familiar with, and it's one that is really weird to a lot of people. It's the parable of the fig tree. The, the cursed fig tree. Why does Jesus curse this fig tree? Now, so far in all of our prophetic studies, Mark is the only account of the Olivet Discourse that we haven't studied because for the most part, the, the Olivet Discourse mirrors Matthew exactly. Only Luke and Matthew are distinct. <clears throat> but Mark does something different in how he sets the sequence of events. In other words, in Matthew, the... the um, Olivet Discourse comes, and then Jesus curses the fig tree. But in, in Mark, Jesus curses the fig tree. He goes to the temple. He uh, uh, casts out the money changers, and then he gives the Olivet Discourse, and then he ends the Olivet Discourse with the parable of the fig tree we've already looked at that, that uh, leads to the fig tree generation stuff. Mark buttresses or bookends the, all of those events with these two fig tree parables. Let's go to Mark 11, 12 through 13. It says, Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Now we already know that figs, they're peculiar because the blossoms of the fruit appear before the leaves. So when it comes to a fig tree, if there are leaves, the tree should have fruit. But then we're left with the very, rear the very weird statement that Jesus is looking for this when it's not even the season for figs. Why is he expecting figs when it's not even the season for figs? Ah, because the tree still had leaves. And remember what I said, sometimes in the Mediterranean climate, 
that tree would keep its leaves and it would keep those green, inedible, hard, stubborn figs over for the winter and you'd get like that bonus crop. They might soften. They might turn pink. They might maybe fruit. So when he saw leaves, not only did it not have the first fruits of that year, but this tree didn't even have the carryover fruits that should have been there from the last year. This was a loser tree. And Jesus gave it every chance. So the late harvest had given ample time to ripen and still there was nothing. So in response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. <clears throat> in Luke 3, Jesus is discussing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children from these uh, raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now, he says, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. We see the symbolism from Isaiah coming back. If you're not good for fruit, you're only good to burn. But what's interesting is while the fig tree Israel was cut down and cast out of the vineyard, the land, its root was not destroyed. The axe was only laid at the root, meaning the root was left in the ground. It was not killed or removed. There's a promise of an opportunity to return. Let's go back to Mark 11, 20 through 22. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree, which you cursed, has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. And what is super interesting, this is after casting out the money changers. Of course, Jesus goes on here in this uh, chapter to say some things we're very familiar with. This is where he says, if you say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, he's talking about obstacles. What's the obstacle in the metaphor that's being given to us here? The obstacle is the obstacle to faith that had become the Jewish nation because they weren't being the witness to the nations they were intended to be. Our great faith is actually about removing obstacles to faith. We speak to obstacles to our faith. They can be removed. The concern of the disciples throughout the series of stories in Mark is the restoration of Israel and the final parable in the sequence in Mark 13 is to watch for the leaves of the fig tree. There is still a sense where generation, as I said in the first session, it can mean nation. God hasn't cut out this nation. He has a promise for them to come back. We're coming to the end. So now I want you to briefly understand the olive tree, and then we're going to dovetail this all back in together. Jeremiah eleven sixteen 16 and following says, The Lord called your name Green Olive Tree. That's what I'm going to name my kids someday. Green Olive Tree. That won't get them beat up in school. Lovely and of good fruit. With the noise of a great tumult, he has kindled fire on it, and its branches are broken. For the Lord of hosts who planted you has pronounced doom against you for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense to Baal. So we see here that the green, beautiful olive tree is getting treated a whole lot like the vine earlier on. It's warned that its idolatry and its branches shall cause it to be broken off. Well, that's interesting because Paul in Romans 11 evokes a parable of two olive trees and there is the olive tree symbolism that then takes place in the New Testament. And I would just want to read a portion of this here. <clears throat> it says, and if some of the branches were broken off of you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root. The root supports you. 
So what's being done here? One is called a good olive tree. That's Israel. The other, a wild olive tree. That's the Gentiles. And the main root is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The tree was holy because it was... Um, the tree was holy and separated. The root was holy, and thus so were the branches. Paul goes on, he says, You will th say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Israel was done away with that I could inherit the promises. Well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty about this, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches... He might not spare you either. They were broken off because of their unbelief and Gentiles were not grafted in that they might take the place of the good olive tree's branches, but that the branches of the wild olive tree might be a partaker of the good root of the olive tree. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward you goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in for God is able to graft them in again. God says, yes, I broke them off, but if they stop in their unbelief, he can come back and he can put that good faithful, the nation of Israel, he can graft them back in to his kingdom again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches of that cultivated olive tree be grafted into their own olive tree? We see that it, it, it's not natural to take a wild bush and graft it into a cultivated bush. In fact, that's, that runs contrary to nature, but God did it for the sake of the church. And the church has not taken the place of Israel. That's error. For the wild branches do not remain on the good olive tree, but we will be broken off if we lose what we were put there for. And the Jewish, the original, the natural branches can be put back in again. Grafting is a sophisticated horticultural practice, and I don't even begin to have time to get into all of it today. There's a couple of points I want to make. In grafting, the practice is to graft the good olive onto the wild so as to improve the fruit of the wild olive. If the wild olive is grafted onto the good olive, the effect is the reverse and the good olive will run to wildness. So Paul knew what he was talking about when he said that the grafting of the wild olive onto the good tree was contrary to how you do this. From this, we see that the injection of Gentilism into Judaism is not beneficial to Judaism. The Judaism is of purer stock than Gentilism. And for the purification of Judaism, Gentilism or the wild branches must be removed or cut off or taken out of the way so that Judaism can flourish again. What do you think that means? When is the Gentile church taken out of the way? We got to be taken out of the way so that Israel can come to the place where it repents. But the taking out of the way will be a witness to Israel. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, this is not speaking about the time of the Gentiles. This is talking about a specific number of Gentiles a number that God has on Christians who will be saved by grace, by faith. There is a specific number, and when that number is met, the blindness can come off. <clears throat> so it's important to take away these lessons, and it's important to understand the order in which they take place. Blindness in part until wild branches do not replace natural branches, and God has not cast away his people. We can continue in God's goodness, but we will be taken out of the way. So what I wanted to show you and why I've walked you through all of this before I make my final point for this morning is this commentary that I've shared with you on these three different trees that you can clearly see throughout the scripture was originally written in a commentary on the Bible by a pastor named Clarence Larkin. 
Now, he obviously is describing the return of Israel to their land and all of those things, but here's the, here's the catch. He wrote all this in 1918, 30 years before Israel became a nation. When he wrote everything you just read, everything I just taught you, it was still prophecy that Israel would ever return to their promised land. That tells me, and it should tell you, that a literal interpretation of the text is always the right interpretation of the text. If we're going to use symbolism, we have to use it from the Bible's rules, not some randos, totally made up allegorizations of scriptures. You understand what I'm saying? So let's finish the pattern as we wrap this one up and put it to bed. <clears throat> God's prophesied end time sequence could be called oiling the figs. And what do I mean by that? Well, you see, there's an ancient but little known practice that's still practiced today. I found lots of internet forums talking about it that can provide a way to ripen figs 30 days or more before their normal ripening date. Almost to, I don't know, cut short the amount of time that it takes to get them to ripen. The practice has been in use since the third century BC or since 300 years before Jesus was ever on the planet. And the process is known as oilification. Oil, in this case perhaps olive oil, is applied to the eye of the fig or that part right at the base of the fruit that's on your screen. It's called the eye of the fig. It's the only part you treat with it. And it's applied at a time when the fig will respond by ripening at a greatly accelerated rate. The timing of this application is of the utmost importance. Applying too early can cause the young figs to drop before ripening. And applications made late are ineffective. The receptive stage seems to coincide with the time that the pulp of the fruit turns pink when it's becoming flush, but it's not yet ripe. Pink is a sign of irritation, right? An application of oil to the selected figs will usually cause ripening within five days after treatment, whereas untreated figs of the same age require more than 30 days longer to ripen. I want you to take a look at Revelation 22, 17. But before I read it, you need to understand that there are those who insist on a linear approach to the book of Revelation. And what that means is Revelation 1 through 22, it's all one linear story. There's no flashbacks, whereas we would say Revelation 12 is, is partly a flashback. There's no parentheses. There's no interrupt. It's all one nonstop narrative. There's no recapitulation of any of the facts. Now, this group of interpreters is different than any other group of interpreters that I've really uh, pointed out to you guys before because they're very limited. They're a small, one might even say cultic group. They're very lim limited. And they call themselves apostolic premillennialists. In other words, they claim that they're in our camp, but they don't believe in a pre-tribulational rapture. They insist that the church is going to go all the way through the tribulation. And really all this is is an aberrant, uh, an aberrant reinvention of the partial preterism that I've already talk to you guys about at other times. Uh, it is totally dependent on allegorizing scripture, but even that, they don't have a historical account of doing it. It's allegorizing scripture based on a select few elite special knowledge and revelation of God that they got, and they're the ones who understand it, and they have to clue you in on it. And church history and, and the history of the interpretative process, exegesis, it's not on their side. Their claim is that the praying church going through the tribulation is what causes the judgments to happen throughout the revelations, that the church isn't removed. And the highest point of the audacity of their claims is here in Revelation 22, 17. It says, And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts say, Come, whoever desires, let him take of the water freely. <clears throat> they make the claim that is the prayers of the church that causes Jesus to return for his second coming. The problem is 
if their linear approach is true in Revelation 19, 11, that's when we saw heaven open and behold the fifth horseman, the white horseman, Jesus on the throne called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. The second coming of Christ takes place three chapters earlier. It's not the church that calls Jesus back. By Revelation 20, Satan is bound and the millennial reign begins. Jesus has to come back before that. So how is the church praying Jesus to come back using Revelation 22, 17 as an example? These people are not the greatest interpreters of Revelation of our time. What then triggers the second coming and not the rapture of Christ? Well, let's go to Hosea 5.15 and remind you of these scriptures. God says, I will return again to my place. How can he return to his place unless he's already left it? This is talking about the ascension of Christ. I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their offense. What offense? Then they will seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. He's talking about the Jewish people. Christ is saying he will return again to his place until the Jews acknowledge that they missed the visitation of their Messiah. That's their offense. How do I know that? Zechariah 12, 10. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Who's that? Jesus. Yes, they will mourn for him as one who mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one who grieves for a firstborn. It is Israel's repentance and acknowledging Jesus Christ as their savior and crying out for his return that causes the second coming, not the church praying for it to happen. Moreover, the beginning of this verse says that God will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. What is a type and symbol of the Holy Spirit in the Bible? Anybody? Holy anointing oil. God's going to pour oil on the green figs. God's going to oilify the figs. That's the, pe- the end of the promise. He's going to employ oil. Apply oil to the eyes of the figs at the moment when their flesh is tender and it is going to cause their ripening to be shortened. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. Is that cool or what? And that right there should show you that the only IHOP Traverse City needs serves pancakes. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. Father, we thank you for your promises to us. We thank you for your promises to Israel. And we thank you that understanding your word and understanding the types and symbols that are contained within it and are self-explained within the word do not need to be reinvented or explained by any man. God, we thank you that applying ourselves to this, we can study diligently to show ourselves approved. I hope in the course of this little mini-series, we have made clear several texts that are confusing to people. I pray that you would give everybody who hears this the willingness to go back and to restudy these things until they can recapitulate it, until they can retell it, until they can reiterate it, as I have done so they can explain it to people who don't understand. Lord, take us out in this world and give us someone to share our faith with this week. The world needs you. In Jesus' name, the people of God said. Guys, the offering is in the back. Remember, we have service next week, but because uh, the 29th is the week after Thanksgiving, we will have no service Sunday the 29th. We will see you next week. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.